Natalie uh, Sandon Stanhope, but you could just call me Nat for short. Um, I'll be facilitating this evening. So, as you're aware, the government recently made some cuts and some changes to the fin financial situation for medical interpreting, and that's affected a lot of people. It's affected the service providers, it's affected the interpreters, and it's in affected the uh, deaf community. Now, changes happen, and they can be quite a confusing time and quite complex. So, Deaf Victoria and Aslia Vic decided to organise this evening's event so that you can receive clearly the information of what's entailed. So there'll be various speakers. We've got two speakers this evening and um, they will clearly explain what's happened. Then um, we will make some decisions. We'll work together and decide what's happening in the not too distant future. So um, tonight's proceedings will uh, first, we've got Jen Blythe from uh, Deaf Victoria. I'm just giving the outline, Jen, so you're not up just yet. Uh, she received a letter from the NDIA. It gets quite confusing between the NDIS and then the agency under it, the NDIA. NABS will, so Jen will speak, then NABS, uh, NABS representatives will speak. We've got a representative from Deaf Australia. And then we have 15 minutes of any burning questions that you, those in the audience need answered now, whether it be from the floor or via live streaming. Um, then we'll have a break for 10 minutes. It'll just be a short break, but it's a good opportunity to discuss um, any questions you might have or to clarify anything with uh, certain members in the audience. And it'll give you, basically, that I've just given you an outline on how tonight is going to run. Now, after the break, we'll resume again for about tw um, 20 to 25 minutes. We'll have some, we'll encourage questions from you all. Once that's done, then we'll ask, you and move um, and what we can do together in the future how we can work together and solve this issue to move forward then we'll um, have a, a little discussion and then it'll close for this evening so just to let you know this is for Auslan users this is for signing members of our community tonight's uh, will not be subtitled we have Nick Ma and Michelle Ashley interpreting for us this evening I'd like to ask you too, before we proceed this evening, um, at various times you'll come up to the stage to ask a question, but keep in mind too that tonight is a respectful event, it's an open discussion, and um, uh, we don't want confusion to happen, so keep in mind we need to resolve this issue. We need to work together, as I mentioned earlier, and to do this we need to be proactive and have a positive discussion, and that way we can actually move forward. Um, tonight's not about finger pointing or blame, it's, it, that'll just drag us down and we, we don't want, it's about us moving forward. So if everyone could just respectfully keep that in the back of your mind for this discussion. Thank you. Also to another reminder for this evening, um, in relation to the information that you will receive, it's not talking about the NDIS trial issue, industrial issues, beg my pardon. We're not talking about any industrial issues or cuts. Aslia Victoria will be addressing that in August, so that will be discussed then. And at that meeting, they will have a representative from Professionals Australia. Nikki Barris will be coming down and she will be speaking to interpreters about their wage entitlements and what's involved there. So they are separate issues. Tonight is just to disseminate information, industrial issues sa are saved for the 4th of August. Now one more before I um, move you over to Jen. Um, the bathroom is just out my door to the right and um, there's a kitchen just to the left there that you can get yourself a drink of water and the bathrooms are just next door. So if there's an emergency, in the case of emergency or a fire, please meet at the lift. There's a door to the right of the lift. We will go down those stairs and congregate out the front of Vic Dev. And you'll be instructed on what to do next once out there. So if anyone has any questions, we've got the stage taped here. So please come up because we need um, our viewers to see clearly. So I think I believe I've covered everything. 
I would like to introduce you to Jen Blythe. She's from Deaf Victoria and she will come up to say a few words. Thanks, Nat. This is a statement from the NDIA. Unfortunately, they couldn't join us this evening, but they have asked me to read this statement um, on their behalf. The NDIA uh, currently considers within plans any need for access to interpreting services. And we're currently undertaking further analysis. Now, in summary, the NDIS plan for someone with hearing loss and use of Auslan already follows, already allows for up to one and a half hours per week of interpreting or translation supports. Secondly, this can be used for any form of communication, including purchase of Auslan for medical appointments. Third, this can be used with any provider, including NABS. The NDIA is currently reviewing the data about frequency of medical appointments and will determine whether the current allocation of one and a half hours per week is adequate or if additional support hours are required. That work is being undertaken at the moment. Instructions for planners and delegates will be completed this week to reinforce the need to ensure plans include allocations for interpreting or translation supports and the appropriate allocation. And lastly, a fact sheet for all stakeholders will be released as soon as possible. The person to contact with any questions is Anne Scordis. So hopefully tonight runs smoothly. Thank you so much for logging in. Thanks very much, Jen. Moving on, I'd like to introduce uh, Michelle Skinner. Now, Michelle's the Director for Community Services at Wesley Mission, uh, which is NABS. So welcome, Michelle. Am I on? Very good. Thank you very much, Natalie. I'd also like to uh, introduce Kerry Gilbert, just to give you a little bit of context, um, just in terms of our roles and positions with Wesley Mission. My role is as the Director of Community Services, which includes uh, quite a lot of services in under that portfolio. One of those um, happens to be NABS. I'd, Kerry is actually the manager of NAB, so I've asked her, she and I will do a little bit of a tag team um, this afternoon or this evening, I'm not quite sure of where we are, we've been running, <laughs> catching planes and goodness knows what else, and um, just so uh, Kerry has responsibility for the day-to-day -day management of NABs and sometimes I'm not always across uh, exactly some examples or detail which may be helpful for tonight. So look, thank you very much. Um, we certainly appreciate the uh, invitation from Deaf Victoria and Asley of Victoria and we certainly hope that we can utilise this evening to give some clarity, um, we hope, <laughs> to uh, NABs and to some of the background of what's been occurring and hopefully what we can do going forward. Oh, now, I usually give off electrical currents. Oh, where am I pointing at? Oh. Do you want to have <coughs> Look, um, this evening uh, we did have um, a presentation to give, to give to you and I will go through that to give you some of the background. But 
<coughs> so as not to confuse any more than we already have um, with the deaf community, um, I do want to say, and I, I need to say, um, it's been intensely difficult uh, for NABs in particularly the last uh, six to eight weeks where there has been um, a lack of cooperation and a lack of consensus between the Department of Social Services and the NDIA as to whether or not NABs is even a service under the NDIA. So we have had uh, to manage that um, for quite some time. As all services, we've known that the NDIS is coming, as have all services. But the exact um, detail of what that means for NABs has been very difficult to get clarity from the Department of Social Services who funds NABs. So I do want to talk a little bit about that tonight. However, um, I do have some good news. <laughs> Always good to start with that, I think is um, as of last Friday, and actually when Kerry and I were in the taxi coming across here this evening, we had still been um, negotiating with the Department of Social Services around NAB's services. And the key messages that we have been consistently and continually giving to the NDIA and the Department of Social Services is that there isn't um, a lot of people from the deaf community who have packages under the NDIS at the moment. No, just about nobody in Queensland has them. Um, people in the trial site, some have them. And the NDIA is telling us that about 70 people, 70 members of the deaf community, that's it, at the moment have NDIS packages. So we have been saying and talking consistently, as has Deaf Australia, and I acknowledge Carl, um, thank you, um, to say, look, this is a nonsense. You can't cut NAB's services at the moment um, whilst there's only so few deaf people who have packages and have access to those funds. The assumption that DSS was working on was that there would be much greater numbers of deaf people with packages under the NDIA than has been the case at the moment. So I'm pleased to advise that some sense <laughs> has prevailed, um, at least for the short term. Um, we have been advised that the uh, extreme funding cut to NABs, which was about 20% uh, of our current funding, has been reduced to about five. So um, what does that mean? It means that we will be doing everything that we can um, to reinstitute um, as many services as we can um, to the deaf community. Um, also, and, and this is what this is about. Um, you know, we have done uh, have continued and consistently consistently lobbied, um, as has Deaf Australia, as has ASLIA, we know, um, to please, to plead with government, to plead with ministers, even to the Prime Minister, um, to look at, be careful what you are doing and look at the timing of transitioning NAB's funding across to the NDIS without disadvantaging um, members of the deaf community. So I just want to repeat that. The good news is that we are anticipating at this stage, and as I said to you, I've received an email um, in the cab coming over tonight, and I participated in a teleconference as late as Friday of last week, where the department is finally saying, um, whoops, <laughs> might have got that wrong. So in, in not so many words. So what does that mean going forward? We will be working particularly through Deaf Australia and getting things out to, getting messages out to the deaf community through our website to advise. And we hope, we are anticipating that we will be able to reinstitute um, 
many of the services that we thought uh, were not going to be able to continue um, due to the 20% cutting funding. Now, I say that that's what's happening. We're hoping that that will happen going forward. But it's not all, that's a timing issue as well. The department has told us that they want to review that again in December of 2016, which means that at that time there is an anticipation that there will be more people with packages and that funding, more funding that was going to NABs will transition to, um, to, the, to the NDIS. So I do want to say from our perspective that is really good news. Um, it's heart-wrenching, as you can imagine, to try and look at what, where do we... This is a service, and we have consistently argued, no other Australian citizen has to try and preempt how many times they're going to go to the doctor, for why, and what for. So, for us, um, we are saying this is a potentially discriminatory to the deaf community, and that NABs potentially should sit in under a communication and access area, as does the National Relay Service, as does TIS. So there's some of the things that you might want to think about. And, um, you know, the NDIS is a fantastic um, model, as long as people get it right. But in hearing that from the NDIA, I would be very concerned if people are looking to and thinking that one and a half hours of interpreting support per week would go anywhere near what people require and what people should be able to achieve. So, um, I just think it would be good to clarify something that has come up um, fairly consistently and that is how long has NABs known about the funding cut? Um, if I could just show you. This is a response from the NDIS as late as March of this year and you'll notice just the two areas there that are in bold. You can see what the NDIS's response was to the question that was put to them. They considered that NABs was not a fit under the NDIS. So of course when we received that, we breathed a sigh of relief. Um, but um, they went ahead and changed policy after that. So I, I just want to assure you that we have not known, very clearly, we have not known about this funding cut for three years. What we have known it is about the proposal to put NABs in under the NDIS, which we have vehemently opposed because it's been quite obvious what some of the ramifications of that would be. And it has only been in the last few weeks that we were advised that it was going to be a 20% funding cut. So I think it's important that everybody knows that. In fact, um, it might be helpful for you to know too that ASLIA actually wrote us a letter of support in 2014 over this issue. So it's not an issue that's been hidden. Um, it is something we have talked uh, to other stakeholders about, as we have at our reference group meetings where ASLIA, for example, has been present, as has Deaf Australia. But we did not know in literal terms financially what it was going to mean. And we kept asking and we couldn't get an answer. And we only got an answer very recently. So I just think it's important that we clarify that for all of you. So these are some of the things that Michelle just mentioned. The NDIA feels that there should be uh, many, many deaf people with packages by now. And so in their minds that justifies the cut and therefore um, the packages will make up for the shortfall. Uh, NDIS planners are still telling people that NABS is not in the NDIS. And out of the 70 that have packages, only 38 have any money for interpreting in them. Um, planners are just not addressing that need and they're still saying to people, we had a, a call from Western Australia only a week ago um, asking why, um, you know, deaf people haven't got money for interpreting. They don't think medical interpreting should be included because they think NABS is not included in the NDIS. Um, the NDIS also is focusing in trial sites on people who are already registered in disability services. Deaf people are not. And so it's sometimes it's six to 12 months before they will be seen, before th they can even start to negotiate a package. 
and so that is proving to be a difficulty. And the NDIA until now has produced no information in Auslan on their website or anywhere else. So the deaf community um, has been in the dark about this and that, that also you know, is, is a problem or has been a problem. And that's just those numbers that I mentioned. So in another question that has come up is about bookings. Are they limited to one hour? No, they're not. One hour is the NAB's minimum. But if bookings go for longer than an hour, then that is fine. That will be accommodated. It's not a problem at all. So our mandate has been from the department to continue to provide uh, you know, as many appointments for deaf people as we can until such time as they get a package. That's what we have to do. And we need to tell you too that this is only the first cut. 2017 and 2018 we'll see further cuts. So this is only the beginning really. We need that, we need either need NABs to be out of the NDIS totally or we need deaf people to go and get their packages and either use NAB services or other services, whatever it is they choose to do. But it, it is only the beginning and it's, it's um, yeah, there are going to be more ramifications for things down the track, that's for sure. So I guess in terms of what deaf people can do, what the deaf community can do, go and see your local members, write in, you know, or, or send Auslan videos into the NDIS, the NDIA, DSS, as many of you have already done, and tell them that what you want for NAB services. And if you are, if deaf people are going for packages, they need to ask for money for medical interpreting. And our suggestion would be, and, and we're perfectly happy at NABS to provide people with a history of their use of medical services over the last 12 months to give them an idea of what they can forecast. And, you know, I would double it because you just don't know, do you? I think that's probably the picture from us. So we look forward to any questions a bit later. Thank you, Kerry. Thanks to Michelle and Kerry from Wesley Mission and NABS. I'm sure that your information has provided much more clarity to our audience. Julie Judd recently just um, mentioned that we received a lot of questions already from those on the live stream. So she just wanted to acknowledge that we have received them and we'll wait until question time. Our next speaker is Kyle Mears, who is the CEO of Deaf Australia. Welcome. Thank you. Look, I'd like to say thanks to Aslia Vic and Deaf Victoria for organising this evening's discussion. Um, I'm here to speak about human rights and, and a human rights perspective. What is important yeah, to this issue for the deaf community, their rights uh, to access and use interpreters, to use Auslan. So I'll be speaking primarily about this point. I'm not sure of the history that led to if, if you're unsure of leaving, uh, uh, if you're unsure of the history that le led to these uh, cuts, I'm going to explain those in detail. In 2011, NDIS and NDIA received some cuts. 
they were launched. There was the Better Start program, the Aged Care Hearing Australia. There was a range. There was about 13,000 different organisations who received government funding. And it was the disability service was put under NDIS and that was NABS was one of those. There's been many, many cuts to the disability sector at large. This, this PowerPoint, I used this with the NDIA and the NDIS in June at the I used this PowerPoint when I presented to the NDIA and the DSS earlier this year. And I spoke to the United Nations Convention of the Rights of Persons with a Disability and what that meant. I showed different articles and compared them to the Disability Discrimination Act that we have in Australia. And what DSS has done is interpreted what uh, what our human rights are and by putting classifying us as a disability and moving our services to under the NDIS is wrong. The National Disability Strategy, their vision, vision statement is what is on the slide behind me. And this comes from the Commonwealth Government. I won't go into too much detail about uh, the convention because it is quite dense, but I will be making this PowerPoint available on Facebook as well as the Deaf Australia vlog so that you can read it in more detail at your leisure. Now, the f Article 5 talks about racial discrimination. And then we have political rights, secondly, the covenant, and then convention of the rights of the child. Now, all of these have one thing in common, and that is language. Auslan is a language. I'm sure you agree with me from the crowd. Yes, thank you. However, the DS DSS and the government consider Auslan users or Auslan as a disability service. The convention, which the United Conventions on the Rights of the Persons with Disability states quite clearly in clause E of Article 9, sign language interpreters. I sit on the NDIS CEO forum, which meets every six weeks to discuss different issues affecting people with disabilities. And I, I mentioned the lack of Auslan videos on their website. And I've constantly asked them time and time again to play every six weeks, in fact, to please translate their information into Auslan. And it hasn't happened yet. The NDIS, or NDIA rather, is not providing information in Auslan. I've tried, they failed. Whether they're not making an effort or lack of resources, I do not know the reason, but fundamentally, only seven, it's just not being provided. Deaf people are being excluded to accessing this information. Now only, out of all of the deaf people that have an NDIS package, only 37 have included interpreting services. In 1991, Dawkins, he acknowledged that Auslan is a community language. Way back then, it had already been printed. However, it's a very much different view. Has this policy IS, please clarify your decision making. What's informing it? We all understand that the deaf community is very broad. 95% of deaf people come from uh, f 
families that can hear. Most deaf people live in metro areas of capital cities. Michelle and Kerry have already touched on the NDIS trial sites um, and that many of the trial sites are in regional areas. Sydney and Melbourne will not have the complete rollout in 2019. Worst case for Queensland, um, they won't have any rollout until till then. What's going to happen before then? Uh, I've already addressed the government about this. I sent a letter to all MPs last year about this very issue. Christian Porter himself, the Minister for Social, S Social Services, who is responsible for the NDIS rollout and program, is someone I sent letters to as one of the MPs in Australia, whether they're from the House of Representatives or the Senate. And Christian Porter himself, who reports... Di he... he declined to respond. It says a lot about that, doesn't it? Communication and engagement with the deaf community. I referred to census data to work out how many signing deaf people there are in Australia. And it seems to have increased from 2001 to 2006 to the last census in 2011, which is 9,723. Now, next month, we will be having a census again. I'm wondering if we might increase that number to 13,000. And if you look at the projection to the year 2016, 2021 and 2026, those numbers should increase. At the same time, we are looking at how many interpreters are accredited every year. And that parallel, and on average, there are about 55 new t new in newly accredited interpreters every year. That's roughly 250 to 270 new interpreters a year, every five years, every five years rather. Now, we will see the supply and demand issue become even more of one. I've also tried to address this very issue with the government. Are NDIS going to look at this shortfall of supply of interpreters? I do not know. I look forward to their response. The other thing about the NDIS and their rules are that interpreters do not necessarily have to be accredited. They need to show experience of interpreting. So does that mean because my family, a member of my family may be fluent, I can use them as an interpreter? That's just not right. That I could use a family member or a neighbour? Would I use, if my toilet was broken, would I ask in its door neighbour just to fix it to me or would you engage a professional, a plumber? It's the exact same philosophy, of course. A deaf person would, would want or would prefer, would need an accredited interpreter. It's the same principle. So if an accredited interpreter is not provided, who's liable for that lack of, for that substandard provision? Is it the NDIS? Who is it? Are we going back to the old days when before NABS was established and people would rely on family members? It cannot happen. I queried, uh, I, I asked the NABS, NABS to provide me with some statistics. And over f five months, they provided interpreters for 11,000 bookings. And fortunately, they uh, shared with us the good news that the 20% cut has only has been decreased to just 5%. So already, five, if with that 20% cut, that would mean 5,000 bookings would go uninterpreted. 
now. It just doesn't work out to me. It doesn't make sense considering how few people have an NDIS package and even fewer that have interpreting services included in that. Interpreting at a medical appointment is essential. It's not reasonable. It's essential. So the government is liable to ensure that this, is, this service is provided. Those from a cold background, a cultural and linguistic diverse background, they have access to free interpreted, interpreted medical services through TIS, the Translation and Interpreting Service. And that is funded by the DSS. However, we are not afforded that same access. Why is that? It's just not right. They don't have their services capped, yet we do. The NDIS principles, uh, do, well, to, to, res to be eligible for funding, according to the NDIA, NDIS criteria, is that is reasonable and necessary. If you fulfil that criteria with your, with your requests, then you will receive your package. However, language isn't just reasonable, it's a human right. It just doesn't make sense to me. And it goes back to the perspective of DSS and what sign language means to, to them. And they consider sign language as a disability, whereas we see it as a human right and a language. The NDIS expect a ratio of 20-80. 20 being those who uh, cannot manage their own package and who have to rely on other agencies to manage their funds. Those are people with severe disabilities. The other 80% would, would, would be where deaf people fall in who can self-manage their funds. This is going to be a new experience for many in the deaf community and I think that's great because we are able to make our own choices. We have control over our funding and our services. However, not so much for the medical, medical services. I've already queried this with NDIS. I've asked, well, as Kerry already explained, uh, we were assured that medical services would be kept separate to NDIS. The bottom line is medical services are an essential service. Sign language, access to sign language is a, is a human right. We need to keep NAB separate from the NDIS. Thank you, Kyle. Now uh, we have time for some questions from the floor. Um, we've got plenty of time. So I would like to ask uh, if there's one or two questions uh, from the floor and um, we could take those now. So um, we've, we've got plenty of questions, like I mentioned earlier. So I. Um, yeah, I'd like to address the ones here in East Melbourne first. Any burning, qu burning questions people would like to ask? Please, come up. Please, come up. Yep. Hello. Um, hi. I'm a full-time carer of my elderly father who's a hearing man, and um, I, 
I want to, you know, when he has NAB's appointments, medical appointments, when he has medical appointments, I'd like to book an interpreter via NAB's so that I can access this. Now with the cuts, my concerns are how I'm going to access these appointments. Thanks for your question. Um, I guess the short answer to that is is that we will continue to provide you with support. No problem. Okay, Kim, you, you had a question you'd like to ask? I guess my question's in relation to the Department of Social Services, DSS. Is that separate from Centrelink? It is. Okay, they, they're considered separate. I just wanted to clarify that. DSS should come in here. I, I, I'd like to invite them in here. We, we get a minister, perhaps a CEO, to come here and speak to our members and secondly, I would like to them to... I've been meeting with interpreters and there have been quite a few complaints and they're annoyed and I, I want them to be more positive. I think they're confused. I don't think it's fair on our interpreters. And thirdly, those of us who are going to be 60 or 65 and aren't eligible for the NDIS, what happens with NABs? You know, now that the, it's not a 20% reduction. My brother, for instance, is he's gonna be 73 soon, and I'm just considering him, and what is he gonna do? My sister-in-law also is turning 70, so they're confused, um, and it impacts the wider community like this as well. So um, we need support for a, our interpreters and I think the best thing is for to get DSS in here to explain. Kim, you asked whether DSS were invited. We did. Unfortunately, they didn't respond. We sent them two invitations. We also invited the NDAA and finally they responded on Friday. It's unfortunate and we agree they should be here. Now the other questions you asked, I'm not the right person to answer. So perhaps someone else? Okay, there were two questions you raised about interpreting and uh, the changes to their employment structure. I recognise um, I recognise that NDIS currently now is new, it's a bit up in the air, there's structure re-changes, it's a new system. I understand there's a lot of ambiguity going on at the moment and they're trying to work through that. So really, NABS is in the same boat as far as, you know, what does this funding cut mean? What, how does, what are the implications of it? So that's kind of forced businesses to actually uh, change how they manage their services. It's, it's, it's forced them. Now, is it the right strategy to use? I don't know. I think it's, it's, it's teething issues currently, and until we get on the right track, that'll teeth it, to, you know, tease itself out. Now, with the 65 age bracket question you asked earlier, I know many people are quite confused about the eligibility criteria, you know, and the rules associated to that. If you're under the age of 65, um, say you're 64 years of age, you can join NDIS and sign up and you can get interpreters for your appointments. Now, if you're 65 years of age, the question is, can you, 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 you will remain under the NDIS. However, you must sign bef under the age of 65 years of age. You must join up. 64, beg my pardon. I need to be crystal clear on that. If you miss signing up at the age of 64, then you've missed out. But if you sign up at the age of 64, you have longevity of cover with the NDIS.
Kerry would uh, like to respond. That's all right. Um, just from NAB's perspective, for over 65s, we will continue to provide services for over 65s. Um, we have, until today, had on our website that we were providing in specific areas. However, we have always uh, said that if over 65s have particular areas of need, then they need to tell us that because we recognise that that brings its own health issues as different to younger people. We have asked the question about over 65s to DSS repeatedly. They have not given us any clear answer about what the future holds um, in relation to services for deaf people over 65 and their interpreting needs. But for the moment, we will continue to provide services. So um, if DSS come up with a plan, I guess they'll let us know. Thanks for your response. Look, I think we'll leave it for now. We've got some questions uh, online that need to come through. It's Julie Judd speaking, and the interpreter is going to relay some of the comments and questions that we've received online. First of all, I'd like to relay something from Debbie Allam, E-L-L-A-M, from the Hunter trial site. She mentions that there are a few issues happening up here. Deaf NDIA participants must now ask for a review to add extra hours for medical interpreting. This is a long process and I would like to see planners have some education about the current NAB situation. They, they literally know nothing at the coalface. And that's just a comment. I'd now like to move on to a question and the first one is, can we please get facts on the transition timeframes of reduced NAB services? I think that's a question for NABs, if they're able to respond to that. Thank you uh, for the question. Um, it is a little bit uh, confusing for everybody at this particular point in time, but as I have said, the good news that we bring tonight is that we will continue with services as they were previously delivered by NABs going forward at least for the next six months. That is what we have been advised by the department in a teleconference on Friday and again in an email just tonight on the way here. Um, I had specifically asked um, the Department of Social Services to give me something to um, speak to tonight. Um, they haven't really done that, but um, in their defence, they have given me um, the approval to convey to you tonight um, that they have taken on board that there are very few members of the deaf community with packages. So to actually reduce NAB's funding and or redirect it to the NDIS from the 1st of July was going to disadvantage too many of the deaf community. And that is the issue that we have been trying um, collectively with, definitely with, um, certainly through Deaf Australia, certainly through us, ASLIA, to get that message through. So in answer to your question, NAB services will continue as they were um, at least until December. But I think one of the things that we do need to have a conversation about, as Natalie was saying, is that 
the deaf community really needs to give some thought as to whether you want NABs to be in the NDIS or out of the NDIS. Um, we've been lobbying for it to be out of the NDIS, but if people want it in the NDIS, that's entirely up to you. But um, I think, and maybe that's not something that we can answer tonight or that you can answer tonight, um, but certainly uh, NAB services will continue as they were for the deaf community and we are, with, with the funding cuts, we are trying to ensure that we are able to put as much of that funding that we've got back to appointments for the deaf community so that, you know, we're not having to try and make some decisions um, around what services we might need to um, not be able to provide. Just to give you um, some uh, additional information, I promise I'll be quick, was um, about 70% of our uh, appointments, and not surprisingly, are for GP and specialists. So that was one of the things that we're obviously concerned that need to, to stay and be, and are now critical for people. Thank you. While you're there, Michelle, there's another question addressed to you. Now that the funding cuts only uh, five percent, will you reverse the cuts to interpreters' paying conditions? A few people are saying um, a few things along those lines. Yes, certainly. Um, I think that's a reasonable question. Um, we certainly are reviewing, and interpreters would be aware that we. Um, have sent correspondence to them around terms and conditions that we are putting forward. Um, I can't really answer that um, at the moment, but certainly I would expect that there are a number of um, questions coming through that do relate to industrial relations. I certainly um, am more than happy for us to take those on board and provide um, answers to those because I am aware that there is specifically a meeting next week for interpreters so we certainly take on board that we will take all of those questions and attempt to get um, some answers back to those. Thank you. Yeah. Um, no, you no. no, you can't interrupt. You, you can put your hand up and let the facilitator manage that. I'm happy to talk to you after if that helps. We will have time for, for questions from the floor, so um, you will have the opportunity later. Um, we're, we're, we're taking some questions online at the moment, okay? So hold that in the back of your mind. Um, the two of you there. And Julie, do you have more questions? Plenty. Uh, a question, I believe, from a deaf participant live stream. Will NAB stay the same as it was before the cuts? For example, optical, dental and other specialist appointments. This is for people without the NDIS. Thank you for the question. Um, yes, the answer to that is yes. Uh, we will be providing a full suite uh, of services going forward um, as per the communication that we've had today. But as Michelle has already mentioned, there is going to be a review in six months and that's come from DSS. So they will reassess the situation uh, in December. So that's, that's the best that we can say at this point. Um, another question for NABS. <clears throat> um, in communication with individual interpreters, Jen Axford has stated that all staff of Wesley Mission have been affected by the funding cuts. What has the reduction in salary been for Wesley Mission and NABS management and what has been the reduction in work hours for management 
of Wes Wesley Mission and NAB's management. Look, that's not an appropriate question for this particular forum. Um, I'm sorry, there's no easy way to say that. Um, <coughs> Wesley Mission Brisbane is a large and diverse organisation. We have about two and a half thousand staff. We have um, so, and, and we operate in southeast Queensland. Um, the email I think that would have gone uh, out from uh, Gen Axford did talk about uh, the fact that all NAB's staff have been affected and that is quite correct. You would be aware that um, staff in the call centre, they have lost hours. Um, our managers in the call centre have lost hours. Um, Tasmania, we have lost the dedicated interpreter there um, and that was uh, to try and pull uh, additional funding in to be able to... Um, we still will provide services in Tasmania and I think the rationale and certainly in conversations with the department, the rationale for having a dedicated interpreter in Tasmania some 11 or 12 years ago has changed significantly um, now. Uh, the deaf community, when we first started working with them down there, were very... Um, were not... Uh, used to working with interpreters, there was very few level three interpreters down there or access to. Um, that is, that situation simply just not the situation anymore. So that, um, that bucket of money, it made sense to bring it back into um, the central pool of interpreting funding to enable as many, and I keep going back to that, to enable us to provide as many interpreting um, appointments for um, private medical as we could. Just to let you know, we have been able to maintain the dedicated interpreter in the Northern Territory and that is a different issue. Um, but that's what's happening. Thank you. An additional um, question. Um, reinstating services until December is what you've mentioned and this um, live streamer has asked will all services be reinstated or just select services? All. Um, and, and obviously we've got a lot of work to do between now and December um, to keep... Uh, the, the NDIA are the ones that actually tell us how many deaf people have um, packages in those areas but it's really um, you know up to the deaf community I suppose as to um, which way you want that to go in the end um, an interpreter from Brisbane has said how was the list of interpreting services that were going to be provided for, this is with the recent 20% cut, chosen. Was there any analysis of the most regular appointment types that NABS receives so as to make the most out of the limited options that deaf people would have? Thank you for the question. I think that that is um, a, a good question and yes, uh, there was, we were given essentially three weeks ago the, um, the news that we were expecting a 20% funding cut from NABS. However, over the last 11 or 12 years, however long NABS has been in um, existence, we have very detailed data. We have to respond to the department monthly uh, around what, n not in terms of naming people, but what um, specialisation, what medical specialisation people are utilising. So we have a lot of data and that data was used. And when I spoke earlier, around 70% um, of the appointments that are made through NABs are for uh, GPs and specialists. So yes, they were obviously, and dental. 
So they were the ones that we um, we looked at. The, the There was an issue around allied health and I do apologise for that being so confusing. That was something that was looked to cut, to be cut. But um, when we went back and looked at um, how those services were utilised and the significance of them, um, we reinstated Allied Health even though we were unsure at that stage how we were going to fund it, to be perfectly blunt. We're going to take a break now. Uh, this is a good time for you to uh, have some refreshments and also to discuss what you've heard tonight with those around you. Now, before you go, I just want to remind you that this is an appropriate forum to discuss in any industrial relations issues. There will be an opportunity at a, a meeting hosted by ASEAVIC on the 4th of August. This is more an, an opportunity for information sharing. Thank you and funding cuts. So I'll let you know when we're ready to return.
cycles we've been experiencing. I will firstly, as we recommence, I'll invite some questions from the floor, then we'll go to the live stream and then again to the floor and we'll see how we go. So Adrian Doyle is bursting to ask a question. Welcome, Adrian. Thank you. Where am I supposed to stand now? Look, I guess I've got three questions. I don't know if they're questions or statements, but the first thing I'd like to say is, I'm, must I join NDIS? Because if I don't... Do I have to join NDIS? That'd be one question. What if I don't want to? And the second one would... Ba maybe I've misunderstood some information, but as far as my understanding is with the plan, I've got to log how many hours that I require and what services, I have to list those. But the problem is, with interpreting, how can I forecast a 12-month period of interpreting services? How do I know when I'm going to fall ill or what is going to happen? Thirdly, too, maybe I um, submit... Um, I, 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 I currently look at your website every week, NABS, um, emails, I, I keep... Um, myself abreast of updates and every week I get that in a interpreter error. I think NABS should give us weekly updates in a signed format to keep us abreast of what's going on with the changes. Do you have to join, register with the NDIS? It's really your choice. It's up to you, Adrian. That's the bottom line. However, if all services are transitioned to the NDIS, then and, and you want to access a the service, then obviously you're going to have to register. And that's why I still am so confused as to why medical services services would transition under NDIS because they're an essential service. For example, my son is involved with his local soccer club and often the parents get together throughout the year and I unfortunately miss out now with the NDI with an NDIS package, I'm able to uh, engage an interpreter. That's reasonable, that's something I wish, I desire, whereas medical services, that's something that's essential, very different. Now, your second question was about forecasting how many times you're going to be ill throughout the year. Now, there's been a lot of uh, back and forth as to who is responsible for what and a lot of confusion. And I know it's really hard to predict how many hours you're going to need for a NABS interpreter over a year if you estimate interpreting services for community activities, which might equate to 12 or 15 hours a month, and then you, uh, you could work it that way, it's really your choice. But I think the biggest change for people with a disability is working out, is having to do that because they've never had to do that before. Everything's always been instant they've instantly been able to access interpreters for medical services. So it's going to be quite a challenge for the deaf community, I imagine. I guess with the planning, do you work it on a six-week basis, six months? I know now that the NDIS is going to start ramping up its rollout. There are 30. I mean, 30,000 people will be registered in three years. And so by 2019, 2019, we'll have 460 people. There will be eventually 110 and, or uh, between 110 and 120,000 people registered by 2017. It's going to be very busy for the NDIA. And if you need to review your package because you need interpreters, it's going to be quite a lengthy process. So it's, I suggest you overestimate how much you need early on. Thank you, Kyle. 
We've got a lady up the back. Um, Shelley, would you like to come up and raise your question? Oh, no? You'd like a microphone. Okay. Sorry, I took notes and I don't really like standing at the front. It makes me nervous. But I'm not entirely sure if I'm even allowed to ask this question. I've just been informed that tonight is primarily for deaf people and not for interpreters. So um, I just wanted to ask how, as an interpreter who works primarily for NABs, are we supposed to make decisions about uh, everything virtually by the 22nd? We've been given a deadline. Um, how are we supposed to make those informed decisions when all these things are constantly changing? You're still being updated, so how can we make a decision now on our future? What are we supposed to do going forward? How can we make a decision now, indefinitely? <laughs> Thank you, Shelley. Thank you for that question. I'm not sure that I can answer it tonight. Um, it's been a very difficult situation, obviously, um, for us. I think NABS, well, I know that NABS is the first of the interpreting services to essentially be rolled or to be looked at being rolled into the NDIS. And that's because we are a national service we operate in all of the trial sites. <coughs> I don't know whether um, you've had a... But this is something that all services are going to have to take on board. And it is certainly around sustainability for all services. And I guess the bottom line for us is trying to ensure that as many hours of interpreting appointments or medical appointments can be delivered um, for the bucket of funding that we receive. I know I'm not answering um, your question um, specifically and I probably am not going to um, tonight because I think there are certainly some transitionary, there, well there are transitionary arrangements that are in place at the moment as you would be aware with letters that have gone out to interpreters and we would like to receive um, feedback from interpreters. We probably have, um, inter well I know, not probably, we have received um, feedback from only about 50 or 60 of those um, interpreters when we have, when we employ on a casual basis around 500. So <coughs> I'm not trying to not answer your question, but the issue is I don't want to preempt uh, something that I'm not really quite sure about at, at, this, at this particular time. But I'm hoping that we will have some clarity or some further clarity for you um, at the meeting on the 4th of August. So thank you for the question. Could you remain? Um, I'll sign in between the two of you. Um, we've got another question um, from live streaming. And so if you could just stay for that, that'd be great. This relates to what you've been talking about and it just extends on it. Um, just, um, can you turn that one off? Sorry. Sorry. Um, it relates to um, the email that interpreters have received in terms of replying to NABs by the 22nd of July uh, under the new conditions. Um, is this now still relevant with the information that's been um, shared tonight and there's been a request can this deadline be extended to the 8th of the 8th um, so that the meeting um, with ASLIA about industrial relations issues can take place on the 4th of August would NABs consider that? Um, I would have to take that on advisement obviously there um, is a process that we are moving towards and we have obviously received legal and industrial advice in and around that as well. But um, 
Kerry and I are both back in Brisbane tomorrow and we will seek um, Julie if it's all right for us maybe to get that information back to you. Would that be appropriate? Sure, and I can pass that on to Aslia National who can then disseminate the information. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll move on um, to some more questions from the live stream participants. Oh, there's one other question from the floor, I beg your pardon. Um, thank you, Michelle. Carly, you would like to ask a question. I'm a deaf counsellor and I'm just concerned about NABS's future because I provide counselling services. I guess I'm curious um, with medical interpreters, psychologists, psychiatrists and counsellors, will they still be uh, funded by NABS so that I can continue counselling and um, will that be when it gets under, when it eventually moves to NDIS, what will that look like? So I'm curious. Thanks, Carly, for your question. Um, yes, um, we will continue to support that under mental health services, so that's fine. Um, what it's going to look like going forward, I guess we really don't know. We have to wait and see what DSS decide come December this year. But um, that's probably the best answer we can give at this time. Now we're going to open up the questioning uh, from live streaming. Thank you. This is a question and a response from me, Julie Judd. Well, I'm going to read out the question, but I'll respond as, as Leah Vic President. Um, and there's been a number of um, messages come through asking, will the meeting on the August, August the 4th with Professionals Australia be live streamed? Um, I've just confirmed that that I'm just aware that the other microphone's on and we're getting some feedback. Um, I've just confirmed that um, we're going, Aslia National is going to uh, arrange as best we can to have that live streamed so that that can be another forum for interpreters to ask questions in relation to industrial relations throughout the country. Secondly, the question will be, is, is NABS going to be in attendance at that meeting? And the answer to that is no. It is separate to the funding issues. Uh, will it be interpreted and accessible to the deaf community? Yes. Um, and in relation, further relation to this comment is perhaps the reason people are keen to share their industrial relations concerns tonight is because they feel that this is their only, one and only opportunity to do so. So just to reiterate that there is another opportunity for interpreters to talk about the industrial relations issues. So we'll move back to the, the comments and questions uh, that we've received in regarding, regarding the funding. This is from Lizzie. My concern is that NABS will continue to prioritise the provision of deaf interpreters to people who need them. I've worked as support worker for deaf people with mental illness for the last 10 years. And as an interpreter for the last five years, I know that for some deaf people, having a deaf interpreter at all their medical appointments is crucial. Any cuts to the provision of deaf interpreters could have devastating consequences for some people. So I wanted some reassurance about that. Uh, 
Uh, we will most definitely continue to employ deaf interpreters where it's required um, and appropriate. There's no problem with that at all. Maybe stay there, Kerry. Um, the next comment is um, in relation to a client having to pay out of pocket for interpreters for an appointment type that was no longer provided by NABS. That has now been reinstated. Will there be any uh, action taken about people who have paid out of pocket for medical interpreting privately because of the cuts, recent cuts? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, we would look at that, so I'd suggest that that um, person send us an email with some details um, and we'll take that under consideration. Okay. Um, the next comment is, will the minimum appointment time increase back to 1.5 hours as it was before the cuts? I feel it should go back to one and a half hours as you often have to wait times, you ha often have to wait at the GP. My dad is deaf blind and he needs the extra time. If the interpreter has another job to go to and they can't stay over the hour, then the deaf person is left with no interpreter if the appointment goes late. Well, as, as we mentioned previously, uh, we're not suggesting that appointments can only be an hour, um, that there are arrangements for uh, appointments to go over an hour. It can be an hour and a half, it can be two hours, it can be three hours, it can be four hours, depending on the nature of the, the situation. Yes, it will probably require a little more planning on everybody's part. Uh, some assessment by us in the call centre in talking to practitioners to just try and um, get some indication as to how long they think appointments will go. Um, so we're not suggesting that appointments are limited to an hour. Uh, if they need to go over time, then that uh, uh, over an hour, then that's um, that's fine. We just need to be notified, and uh, we have a process for that with interpreters. Uh, another, another comment has been regarding travel rates affecting people in rural areas. Um, is NABS going to be looking at this and managing this in light of the recent announcements? We'll do our best with that. Um, the NDIS has a, has a very keen focus on uh, video relay interpreting they really want to see that implemented in regional and remote areas and that's not only for um, the purposes of interpreting, it's also for the purposes of delivering all uh, types of other services as well. They are obviously trying to cut costs and so in relation to that, um, NABS will be extending their capacity for VRI and so we uh, we'll probably be looking at a program of um, offering that kind of uh, work specifically to interpreters, um, possibly even uh, from home. So that's something that we're looking at, particularly for regional and remote areas. Because you, you need to understand the NDIS has no um, clear allocation for travel payments. And if there are... Um, circumstances where uh, travel is needed, we're having to negotiate appointment by appointment with the NDIS over that. So it is a controversial area and not only for interpreters but it's been raised by many other service types as well in regional and remote areas where people don't have a support service around the corner like they do in perhaps in metropolitan areas but s other types of carers and support workers have got to travel and that doesn't seem to be recognised by the NDIS. So going forward, that is actually going to become a bigger and bigger issue. Just one quick question in relation sure. to that. Yep. Um, can a deaf person make a booking for one and a half or two hours if they know that the appointment is going to go longer for than an hour? Yes. Okay. Back to Natalie. Okay, now we're going to take a question from the floor. Jean has been dying to ask one.
Okay. Hi. Hi, I've been thinking back to all of the changes. It's been really worthwhile coming here tonight to receive all of this information. Um, Kyle spoke about his lobbying efforts regarding the transition of NABs under the NDIS, and I believe it should be separate. For example, my family uh, might become very suddenly sick and I'll need to get an interpreter constantly. Uh, I, sorry, a family member did fall very ill and I had to access an interpreter many times. Um, if I was to have to forecast that, it would be impossible. We never know when we're going to need interpreters, when a family member is going to become sick. NDIS, um, is that good? That's good for social purposes and uh, supporting sign language and all those things. It's fantastic. But for health and medicine and medi medical services, that's something that's impossible to ask for money for when we just don't know when we'll need it. Fantastic question, Gina. Look, really, all the information is quite detailed, but it's relative to you. I mean, if you have a medical emergency, you can ask an N the NDIS to review p your package. Uh, even an untoward illness that, uh, you know, um, you end up needing hospital services immediately, you can access and ask for specific services for that. However, if you've run out of money, though, that's a different situation. I'm not sure if I've answered your question, but if you are to run out of money from your package, that's allocated once a year. Now, you asking me if, um, what are you talking about general emergencies? Is that, is that, that was your concern? Okay. If you get your, um, if your medical funding runs out, I'm not sure. We're still finding out that information as it slowly drips f through. But um, if you have, in the event of a medical emergency, you are able to access a top-up fund. Thanks very much. Thank you both for that. Benji, would you like to come up? My sign language isn't that hot, so I'm going to speak. Hi, I'm Benji. I've got two deaf parents, both over the age of 65. And I've heard a lot of talk about buckets of funding going back and forth between NABs and the NDIS. Um, so I have, a f like, and the NDIS is getting rolled out um, by 2019, but it's not applicable for my parents in any of that time. I have a feeling that as we transition over to the NDIS, um, funding to NABs will be further cut because the funding moves over to NDIS, which means that services will be cut for my parents who are over 65, who, ne who need it the most. <laughs> um, what, what happens to them when the funding gets cut? <laughs> Thank you, Benji, for your question. And yes, it is emotional, isn't it? Um, what's happening is very unfair to the deaf community across the board. There's no doubt about that. For, for now, NABs will continue to provide services, full services, to people who are over 65. That um, is not a problem at all. Whether NABs ends up being a service for people over 65 only, we don't know. I'm sure that um, there will be some arrangement for deaf people over 65, but whether that sits under disability, whether it sits in the aged care area, uh, we cannot get any clear answers about that at this stage. And I don't think the government knows. I don't think they've really thought that far ahead or been able to make a decision about it, which is why they've left it with us for now. But Benji, please be assured that we will continue to provide services to your parents. 
uh, and to any deaf person that's over the age of 65. And we know that they do have um, very particular healthcare needs. We also understand that this has been very stressful uh, for the deaf community and for the people that love them. There's been so much uncertainty around this. There's been so many changes. It's, as Michelle said before, it's, um, it's a really difficult um, time for everybody. So uh, we will do our very best. Just to add to Kerry's comments, uh, recently David Bowen was on the radio, he's the CEO of the NDEIA and he recognised and acknowledged that those who are over 65 will face um, serious implications and they're investigating how to resolve or address those issues. Now David has promised to email me with his suggestion or with his ideas as to how we can overcome that. Uh, regarding medical appointments and NABs. So uh, when I hear from him, I'll, I'll share it with you. Thank you to those here in the East Melbourne venue for your questions. But before we head over to the live stream, I just want to add something. Julie's just, Julie and Jen have just uh, mentioned that there are so many questions coming through the live stream and unfortunately, uh, with the time restrictions, we can't answer them all. But we will hold on to the questions and we will formulate responses back to you individually at a later time. <coughs> all right, Julie, here's to Julie for some more questions from the live stream. Okay, um, hi again. Uh, just wondering if I can ask Kerry why there have been cuts and changes to the NICSS, the NICS uh, system in Wesley Mission as well as through NABS, even though they are two separate organisations. Shouldn't uh, NICS remain the same and unaffected? They're not really two separate organisations. For those of you that have never been to visit NABS, we, NABS and NICS operate in the same call centre, the same staff, um, the same booking system. Uh, the difference with NICS is, is that it is fee-for-service um, and NDIS appointments, um, other than medical, when deaf people ask for, who have a package going forward, who get packages, ask for appointments that are not medical, they will be put through NICS. But because it's all in, in one area, um, the cuts to NABs unfortunately just affect everything and everybody. Um, our NAB staff work in NICS and vice versa. So it's not actually two separate organisations. This has had an overall effect. That drastic cut has had an overall effect on the total operations of, of um, um, NABs and NICS services. It's probably the simplest I'm, way I, I might have read that out a little bit incorrectly. Sorry, oh, Kerry, okay. just to clarify. Um, why, why there have been cuts, changes to NICS as well as NABs, even though... I think it means that NICS isn't part of the NDIS. And I think you've answered the question that NAB... N NICS is drawn into the NDIS, just as NABS is. This is a comment, I think, for everybody, not just for NABS or Wesley Mission. It's a question from Ryan Gook, CEO of Auslan Services. In 2008, Access Economics released a report, thanks to Vic Def, and found that the average income for Auslan interpreters was then $37,500, compared to the average Australian earning of $57,387 a year. The gap has not got any closer. Employers should be well aware of these things and be advocating to prevent this from getting worse. Imagine the impact of a one-hour minimum when people argue that a two-hour minimum is excessive or that interpreters are expensive. I remind them of the data that contradicts this. Can employers be strong and keep Auslan interpreters' conditions a priority? And I think it's just a comment, so I don't think it needs a response.
Kim raised a question. He's asked me to uh, share it with the audience. Can you please clarify what Nix is, Kerry? Nix is Wesley Mission's National Interpreting and Communication Services. So, NABS. Yeah, it's right. It's the National Interpreting and Communication Services. N I C S S. Sorry, it was my fault. Too fast. Um, so, Nix is an area where we process fee for service appointments that are not medical. NABS is purely medical interpreting. Everything else goes under Nix. But as I explained, it, it all happens in one spot. Does that answer the question? Thank you for clarifying, Kerry. Uh, are there any more questions from the floor? Yes, Kim? I want to go back to DSS. Now, we've got six months until Christmas time with our services reinstated. So let's talk to the fat cat and tell him to stop dreaming, <laughs> please. To those folk at DSS. And also I caught, I, I caught mention of VRI. Hmm. I understand, I understand its advantages, but I support interpreters if they need to travel, if deaf people need interpreters face to face. It's really important for some deaf people. BRI doesn't work for everybody. Technology isn't the answer for everybody. Some people prefer that face to face engagement. I really, I've, I think we need to still allow for that travel for interpreters from the metro areas to the, s to the regional areas. I'm a diabetic and I know that there are l many deaf people who have diabetes. Let's remind DSS that diabetics, diabetes is on the up, it's on the increase. They need to understand, let's give them the message, let's tell the fat cat sitting in DSS office to stop dreaming. When, when we go and see the fat cats, Kim, we might take you with us. Now, in regards to your comment about video relay interpreting, I know there are some people who are resistant to using it. There isn't necessarily the, the national broadband network. NBN hasn't been rolled out, and I know it requires a high-quality um, internet connection. That's something I've also been lobbying the government about. Uh, according to the NDIS criteria, services must be provided locally. NDIS doesn't account for travel time in their budgeting. But of course it's needed. Now, for example, if you uh, want a good interpreter, f f a good interpreter to interpret for your mental health appointment, but you live in the east and they live in the west, unfortunately, that interpreter won't receive travel, travel allowance. VRI might seem like a sensible approach. That's something we need to look at. We can't just put on the back burner. We need to embrace all uh, anything that can help our access to interpreted services, whether it's right or wrong. W there's no right or wrong. Perhaps a better approach is rather than disregard it and say a blanket no, consider it. Let's explore its benefits. Look, 
I'm sorry, Kyle. Remember, different there is varying communication methods used by the deaf community. I'm sorry, VRI just isn't a, an, it's, VRI isn't the answer for everybody. It's important for some deaf people to have that face-to-face -face engagement. I think we're in dangerous territory. We need interpreters. It just doesn't make sense. Okay, look, I'm not disputing with you, Kim, at all. Um, I think it's important to show a variation. That's important. We need a variation of responses, you know. Um, what, you know, what deaf people have, what they don't have, and what they're exposed to, and what's available, I mean, that's it. I mean, I know in the United States, uh, there's many services that are provided through VRI at the moment that they have that we don't. They've got an excellent broadband access. You know, that's an issue here. So we need to improve technology here, get our, our broadband, broadband speed faster. And you're right, you're right. It's, it's trying to, you know, lobby. We need to lobby the government. We have to, that's, that's a given. I know there's some people that disagree with it. Some people think it's valid and worthwhile, but I think we can't just say no because a few people don't care and don't like it. It's important to find a solution that suits everybody here in Australia. Sorry, the interpreters, obviously there was some feedback. Um, you can stay, Kyle, because I believe there's one more question for you. Uh, one question for Kyle. What have Deaf Australia done on this issue prior to April 2016? April 2016, um, in 2014, NABS uh, sent us a letter and they wanted support um, on whether we think they should be uh, considered under the NDIS. And we said, no, keep um, it should be kept separate. Now, before Christmas, I sent a letter to Christian Porter He's the Minister of Social Services. I sent him a letter and heard nothing. I sent him another letter, well, to all MPs around Australia. The MPs themselves approached Christian Porter and then he had to respond to those MPs and those MPs in turn responded to me. I have to, till this day, not received a response from Christian Porter himself. I don't know why. I believe that uh, DSS it has been handing wrong information um, about Auslan being a dis disability service and that's where we hit rock bottom and lost. So I think that's the bottom of the line that I feel that's happened. And today, I sent a letter to um, state and territory ministers of, for health and some of you might think well why why are you doing that if nabs reduce their services or reduce the hours that interpreters actually need and cannot you know where deaf people cannot access the services that they require and then or then find themselves in accident and emergency the state government then are responsible for paying for interpreters. So I spoke to the state government minister and I said, would you like that to occur? Obviously not, but it becomes a state government issue. And if they don't like it, they need to speak to Christian Porter and keep NABs out of the NDIS. So I'm trying different avenues, various avenues to broach this subject.
I also met with an MP from Brisbane. Teresa Cam Gambero, I believe, was her name, and she's an MP for Brisbane. Kerry and I put a letter together from NABS and NDIS and we considered that they were breaching the DDA and um, we wanted to advice on how to traverse this. So we've already developed inf an information kit that we've sent to the MP. I'm happy to post that on our Facebook or our blog so that you can all see what exactly it entails. Um, I'm happy to disseminate fact sheets as well on, on what conversations have been had. Just one quick question for Kerry. NABs, the call centre hours, um, are they Eastern Standard Time? Could you just reaffirm the call centre hours, please? With the changes, they are 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., Monday to Friday. Um, we are going to have a conversation about possibly reinstating Saturdays. Um, it may not be for as long as it was before, but we're thinking maybe between 9 and 12. There's another question, Julie. Oh, Julie's begging me to <laughs> ask one more question. Nick, we need you up here again. Um, and I understand that Jen will answer this question, so Kerry and um, Kyle, you can take a seat. Um, this is um, from one of our live stream participants. And they say, where deaf people and families uh, to go? to find support until they are transitioned into the NDIS. As a person who's not in an NDIS area um, and looking into the barrel of a two or three year wait of restricted medical access for myself and my child, ongoing treatment that's been covered by NABs now may be withdrawn, so I don't have any access until the NDIS. Um, now, Jen is going to respond to that comment. This is a really stressful time for everybody, not just deaf people, for many people with disabilities because uh, it impacts their current services. Now, during the transition period, you can contact myself. I'm the advocacy manager for Deaf Victoria and I can give you as much inf information as I, as I have in what services you can still access. I hope that answers your question. No more questions, Julie? Great. I want to put a question to you all. As a group, as part of the deaf community, interpreters and deaf people, what should we do in moving forward? How can we best resolve the issues we're facing? And I'd really like to hear some suggestions from you all, whether you're here in East Melbourne or accessing via the live stream. Julie Judd's already <laughs> got something. She's received a comment already. But we'll go to Adrian first. I think it's simple solution. Well, not a solution, but let's just make a one page a letter. Everyone sign it. We send it to MPs or email or what have you. But just ensure the government is bombarded with these letters. I think it's the only that's the only thing I can think of, Nat. Excellent. Um this goes along Thank the you. S 
This is uh, a lovely segue that somebody's posted from our live stream. Um, how do we as deaf people and interpreters get involved in more lobbying? More letters to the MPs? Is there templates? Online petitions? Maybe one letter from Deaf Australia is not enough. And another comment along the same lines is a request for all parties present tonight to please post regular updates on your websites and Facebook pages. I think some of the frustration voiced this evening has stemmed from a lack of community understanding and a feeling of underpreparedness. Jen from, um, from sorry, Deaf Victoria um, said, we've, got, we've actually got two note takers here this evening and um, please don't, for, um, nothing's going to be forgotten. All the comments tonight will be remembered. We're noting them down. Uh, your idea, Adrian, about approaching MPs, well, I, that's, I'm curious to that and any other suggestions? I agree that there's a letter template that we could actually give you. There's, there's three, not just one. There's one that can go to the deaf, deaf community, one for interpreters and one for professionals. So I think we need three different templated letters and we're, uh, we've already started to consider what we're going to write down. Uh, deaf Australia will actually change it to, to change org. Deaf Australia are going to use Change.org. We've already been, um, we've already started a campaign using Change.org. And any anything that's fed into Change.org is fed directly to Christian Porter. Uh, as for the letters or the templates, um, there are many different options or how we can move forward with that. And I'm happy to hear your suggestions. There's three more suggestions online. Keep them coming. Thank you. Uh, a comment from Michael Parrymore from Watsonia. There are plans by Deaf Australia, Deaf Victoria to work with NABs in the next six months to lobby DSS to keep NABs separate from the NDIS. And just a comment, NABS is working very well. It's been an excellent system. Why change something if it's not broken? Let's keep NABS separate from the NDIS. Another comment is that we um, make sure that we involve the medical profession and ask medical professionals to get involved. The third comment is more bombardment in Auslan videos so that the government can see that Auslan is important, not in English. It makes it look like deaf people can write in English. Let the MPs book interpreters to get the videos translated and see firsthand how it works. Another comment is do we remember the Deaf Australia campaign where the deaf community called on TTYs to the government all day, every day, until they realised how important it was for the deaf community to have access to a national relay service? Come up, come up, I'll stand here with you. First of all, I'd like to know uh, about Skype. There's not enough hours. Uh, like VRI interpreting, I, if I live in the country, I'm in the northeastern of uh, Victoria quarter and if there's no interpreter, you know, during the night period, how can I actually get a VRI, how do I make contact to book the VRI service? Say I'm at hospital or I'm somewhere else and I need 
to Skype during those hours. I mean, for me, that's imperative as a country person. I live in the country and I can't get interpreters to come during the evenings. So I need an interpreter of a night time and it's not easy for me to get them. So for VRI, it needs to be open 24 hours, please, for us, for our lives. Would you like to respond, Jen, or have you made a note? Sorry, they're just, um, they're, they're waiting. They're, they're just going to discuss and they will respond to your question. That's a fantastic question, Shelley. Uh, unfortunately, not so easy to answer. At the, at the moment with the NDIS, everything's changing and we really don't know what the future's going to look like and what services and access to services will look like, including VRI or Skype. And I understand you feel we need more people to, uh, you need more people to work for VRI and you need the service to be available 24-7. For example, children uh, whose parents have no... Who, who ch hearing children whose parents are deaf, if their parents have a fall, the children, it needs to be something so that... Oh, so deaf children whose hearing parents may have a fall, they can easily press a button on an app and access something or someone via VRI. I know that's a big, interesting issue. Sometimes VRI freezes, the screen freezes, and we're left there waiting. I mean, we need to make sure that VRI works perfectly well. Plus, sometimes too I find um, whether people are at the hospital or at the doctors and they, they don't understand the VRI and how, how it works for deaf people. They need to explain that. When, you know, irrespective of whether you've got what disability or what illness you've got, it doesn't matter what age you are either. People need understanding about what VRI, Video Relay Interpreting, is. And we need access to it when we need it. Can we, how about you and I sit down and talk more about this later, Shelley? Fab. Thank you, and that's a big issue, Shelley. Thank you. I would like to ask Aslia Victoria, um, if, if, if there's, and Deaf Victoria, is there any closing comments you'd like to make? I would just like to say thank you for everyone attending. Thanks for those of you at home watching us tonight as well. We really appreciate your time. We appreciate your feedback and your questions. You've given us plenty of food for thought. Um, you can contact me as the manager of Deaf Victoria um, tomorrow, Julie and I, Julie Judd, the president of Asley Victoria, will be typing up and collating all of the questions and the comments that were sent in this evening. And we will make them that a public document available and we will send that out to everyone so that they are privy to that. We will also put down some actions and you feel free to openly comment on our Facebook page. You're more than welcome there. Okay, if there's... Um, if there's any more questions or comments, feel free to see me at any time this evening. And I will hand, I'm available to give, hand out my business card later tonight. Hello, I just want to say a big thank you to a few people. Firstly, thank you to Jen Blythe from Deaf Victoria for your support and your collegiality in working with Asley Victoria. And I really want to say thank you to Deaf Australia for starting that, that this campaign all those years ago. And I hope that after this forum that the momentum is there and we can mobilise as a community, that we can come together and continue lobbying the government. One voice is very powerful. It's really up to you.
to everyone that's connected in from all across Australia. I'd also like to thank, you, thank Natalie Sand and Stanhope for her excellent facilitation tonight. Also, thank you to Aslia National for their support uh, with, uh, for, on behalf of interpreters. Uh, we, have, they, we have worked with Professionals Australia in, in terms of the industrial relations issues and we'll be holding a meeting soon. And we are also working with the Deaf Society here in Victoria, Vic Deaf, in seeing in how we can arrange support for the live stream of that meeting. With payment, don't worry Brent, <laughs> we will find the money. <laughs> However, lastly and most importantly, I would like to thank Vic Def because without Vic Def's support for this forum tonight, people from, how many people have we got online? 210 people have connected to the live stream. Now that means some people may have gathered in groups, so that could mean even more I imagine 300 to 400 people all around Australia have accessed this live stream and I think that's a first. So a big thank you, a big thank you to Vic Def for your support. And also thank you to NABS for coming down and responding to all of the questions that have been fielded to you. And I would also like to apologise to those people at home who are watching tonight in that we couldn't answer all of your questions. Perhaps you aren't satisfied with your answers, but I feel we have done the best that we possibly can in two and a half hours. So again, thank you everybody. Thank you to the two interpreters that are working tonight. And I look forward to working with all of you moving forward. I've just received a question. How can we how can you how can we you get information in the summary how will okay Jen and I are going to write the summary of everything that was just discussed uh, tonight because it, it might take a few days because I do have another job and my boss is here watching so uh, the two of, between the two of us we will write this summary and once it's ready for dissemination, we'll let you know through Deaf Victoria, Deaf Australia, by the website and Facebook, and also the ASLIA National website, and of course, ASLIA Victoria's website and Facebook. We will share the information as widely as we can, and if you haven't heard anything, please feel free to email either organisations, Deaf Victoria or ASLIA Victoria. We're more than happy to communicate openly with you. Look, before we close this evening, I would like to say, well, maybe you've heard it before, maybe. I think it's worth putting it out there again. Sticks, they break easily, yeah. But many sticks together are really, really hard to break. So on your own, you can lobby and not be successful, but as a cohort, we can be a lot more successful. So just keep that in the back of your minds. Thank you all so much for attending and for those of you at home. Thank you. Good night. Drive safe.